Please tell us about the paper you published on insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is a condition where your body does not recognize the amount of glucose circulating um, and it does not use glucose as a fuel for cells um, because of excess. Um, now saturated fats have a lot to do with that. Saturated fat actually jams the doors to the cells to take in uh, glucose and it completely messes up the mechanism of insulin allowing glucose to go into the cells. We wanted to find out whether insulin resistance uh, increased uh, the chances of cognitive impairment in a large population and we studied that in NHANES which is a large database and we found out that when people have insulin resistance regardless of diagnosis of diabetes had an increased chance of having bad memories and cognitive decline and it makes sense. If you constantly have dysregulation of glucose in your body, and if you constantly are you know, consuming a lot of saturated fat, which contributes to insulin resistance, obviously your brain is going to get shocked and it will not be able to function normally. So it's very, very important for people to understand that insulin resistance contributes to cognitive decline. Do you think it's accurate to call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes? Well, <clears throat> for the last few years, we keep getting different names. Type 3 diabetes, garbage disposal disease, different names. Reality is, it's because we're not understanding that Alzheimer's is not one disease. People come to Alzheimer's from insulin resistance side, which would be a you know, diabetic uh, component, from lipid dysregulation, which has to do with cholesterol and APOE4 and all of that, or from inflammation. You know, people who have repeat traumatic brain injury have a much higher risk of dementia. <clears throat> so the definition depends on which pathway you've taken there. So I think that calling it type 3 diabetes is, is, is not right because it's taking just a small category of the patients. Uh, it's a combination of those. And a lot of times it's all of those things combined. Inflammation seems to be a common pathway though. Even if you come from uh, glucose dysregulation or fat dysregulation, Inflammation seems to be the pathway that ultimately uh, moves the process forward. So it's better to look at it as a, as Aisha said, a more multifaceted disease and, and more complex disease than one pathway disease. How does the prevalence of Alzheimer's compare today to, say, 50 years ago, and how is it trending? Alzheimer's is increasing significantly now for several reasons. One is we're surviving more. Mm -hmm. I mean, right before... Fleming and you know penicillin and all these and people wouldn't live to 65. People have no idea that from 1940s till now the world has changed significantly. Before that time there weren't that many people that would live to 70, 80, 90. We would die from infections. Whenever we give a talk we actually say how many people in this room had a dental procedure in their life? How many people have used the antibiotic? How many people have had a surgery? Almost everybody ends up raising their hand. But I would say most of you would be dead before the 1940s. And so that revolution has helped people live longer. And given that Alzheimer's is not so much a disease of aging as it is a disease of accumulative trauma throughout life. So if you live longer or if you allow trauma to accumulate throughout your life, meaning glucose and lipid and all that, then your chances go higher. That's what's happening. People are living longer and therefore they're facing diseases that actually push the, uh, Alzheimer's forward. As physicians and healthcare providers, we've become really good at managing disease. And you hear that word a lot in the hospitals. You manage diabetes, you manage blood pressure, you manage cholesterol. Nobody ever talks about treating it. You know why? Because the medications that we have, they don't really affect the disease process. They just manage the symptoms on the surface. It's like, you know, you clean off the dirt and the dust from your carpet and you just kind of swipe it underneath it. But the dirt and the dust is already, it's there. You know, you haven't gotten rid of it. And so it's the accumulation of all these pathologies and this damage that's continuously going on in our bodies that result in brain damage. And that's why people who have long-term diabetes on multiple medication, on blood pressure medication, on cholesterol medication, they feel fine, they function, but the pathology continues going on. Mm -hmm. And then they get Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And, and that's why we're actually seeing more and more of it now compared to 50 years ago. Um, what were the main conclusions of your book and research? 
the main conclusions of the book is about hope, that the most important organ that we have, in fact, that what makes us who we are is the brain. We can do a lot about not just preventing disease, but actually having vibrant, growing, powerful brains well into our 80s, 90s, and beyond. And it's our control. Now, whenever we say this, people say, oh, are you, are you actually blaming people who developed dementia and stroke for what they did? No, it's like saying somebody who had a heart attack, it's their fault. No, we identify what things actually put people at risk, how we should learn from that, how we should change for future. I mean, I lost two grandparents to this disease, and I should lost two grandparents to the disease. We're not blaming anybody. But we're also identifying for the fact that lifestyle that, that they led <clears throat> contributed to some extent. And there are things that any one of us can do, not to just avoid Alzheimer's. That's, that's just the icing on the cake. But to have vibrant, growing brains well into your you know, later life. Because the opposite direction is also true. After, if you don't do the right things, exercise, mental activity, uh, good food, your pathology starts in your 20s and 30s. We've seen the decline in your 20s and 30s. You reach a peak in your 20s, and then if you don't do the right things, there's a continual decline in your memory and processing, executive function, everything. But people actually who institute the right lifestyles, they start growing the brain at any age. That's hope. Hope based on science. There's nothing more valuable than that. So we're empowering people, and I think this is a book about empowerment. And as a healthcare providers, I think uh, we have the privilege of being that um, that bridge between the world of science and public health. Um, I think Dean and I um, have completely uh, dedicated ourselves um, to presenting the real data. And I, in our book, we wanted people to know that there really isn't any confusion about brain health. Yes, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of clutter out there, but we've had the data for such a long time uh, about prevention mm. of brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease and stroke, and it all has to do with lifestyle. Absolutely.